Skillshare is for designers, photographers, marketers, artists, and lifelong learners. Skillshare is for foodies, commuters, risk takers, the young, and the young at heart. It's for strategists, free spirits, purists, the bold, the curious, the characters, the makers, and the breakers. Skillshare is for everyone, an online learning community with thousands of classes to advance your career, improve the world, and pursue the work you love. What will you learn next? It all starts on Skillshare. You've probably heard the definition before of a noun as being a person, place, or thing. That is, nouns are the names for all the things that are in the world and all the things that are even out of the world. In that, um, nouns are names for things that are tangible. You can put your hand on them. Uh, a typewriter, uh, if you know what a typewriter is, if, if such thing exists anymore. Uh, but a computer, or a car, or a telephone, or, or even right here, a bear, albeit a dancing bear. Um, nouns also are names for things that are imaginary, like right here we have the uh, fairy, could be uh, Santa Claus. I um, uh, hope I didn't uh, burst anybody's bubble there. Um, but um, also things that are idealistic. Uh, we have concepts of, but nevertheless you can't put your hand on such things as love, or justice, or friendship, or anger, or you know, my feelings are hurt. Well, the feelings can't be touched, uh, but, uh, but we consider them real nevertheless, and, and the description of that is a noun. Nouns divide into two categories, common nouns and proper nouns. So as you peruse the list over here, you'll see that in the one case we have boy, who could be any boy, or we have Billy. Uh, again, we have a woman, it could be any woman, um, uh, or the specific Anita Williams. And again, likewise, city, any city, or Chicago, or a river, or the Mississippi, a very specific river, a company, Ford Motors, or a poet, Robert Frost. Now, one of the things that you notice here, uh, look down the column of proper nouns. One property of proper nouns in English is that they are, for the most part, capitalized, and there are some exceptions. The um, company eBay, for instance, has the idiosyncratic spelling, has adopted idiosyncratic spelling for itself of lowercase, all lowercase, no, no capitals. And likewise, the um, late poet, uh, the late American poet E.E. E. Cummings uh, chose, for the most part, not to capitalize the, uh, uh, the letters of his name that would normally be capitalized. But for the most part, the rule holds that proper nouns are capitalized. One of the properties of nouns is that they can be pluralized, and this means that um, uh, nouns come in two forms. One is singular, that is, there's only one of them, one dog, one computer, one truck, and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, nouns can be plural, which means there's two or more of them. So in the regular form, uh, you pluralize a noun by um, adding an S to the end of it. So if you have one dog, you have two dogs. One computer, you have two computers. One truck, you have two trucks. One book, you have two books. Um, the exception to the spelling rule is if you have a noun such as heroes, which ends in an O, um, and you would add an ES to the end of it rather than just an S. And also you have some nouns that end with a Y, and in this case you um, change the Y uh, to I and add an ES. And so we have a couple of examples here, uh, such as in heroes and company, which changes to companies. Okay, but anyway, but the general point is nouns can be pluralized, and for the most part, regular nouns are pluralized by um, adding an S, or in some cases an ES or an IES. There is a group of nouns that... Um, uh, follows the general idea about adding the S to make a plural, but must make a spelling adjustment uh, because of uh, some issue with uh, the, um, uh, the preceding letters.
So, for instance, if you have a word that ends with F-E, such as knife or wife, you will um, change the F to a V and add an E-S, and so it becomes wives or knives. You see? So, uh, and the same with wolf. Wolf becomes wolves. Loaf becomes loaves. And so, so these are spelling adjustments. You can consider these spelling adjustments because they're pretty universal across words that have these kinds of endings. Also, um, if you have a word that ends with an O, you add an ES, not just an S, but an ES. So tomato becomes tomatoes, potato becomes potatoes, or tomato, potato, if that's how you pronounce it. Anyway, a hero becomes heroes, okay? But that's an ES, okay, at the end of it, okay? And there's another uh, irregular, regular uh, shift, and that is if a word ends with Y, and this is very particular, you have to pay attention to this. If a word ends with Y and is immediately preceded by a consonant, then you change the Y to I and add an ES. So company becomes companies. Um, army becomes armies, but with an IES, not a YES. Okay, so anyway, um, now. Uh, why you have to pay attention to this is because you do not perform this uh, this um, Y to I shift if the Y is preceded by a vowel. So boy becomes boys, okay, with a YS. Valley becomes valleys because it's an EY at the end, so it becomes valleys just with an S. And delay becomes delays. You know, there's many delays on the road to work today, uh, but um, uh, but you just have a regular S. So these types of Y ending words stay perfectly regular. Okay, so now in the next slide, I'm going to talk about really irregular nouns, nouns that are very irregular in the, um, uh, in the plural uh, formation. Now, there are some nouns that are even more irregular in the um, formation of the plural. And sometimes these are words that come from another language, and they retain their um, uh, uh, the form of pluralization in the original language. And so we have such words as cactus or focus, which becomes cacti or foci. Um, analysis or crisis becomes analysis or crises, okay, so um, uh, the, the I becomes an S, um, and not always pronounced so you can really distinguish the singular from the plural. Um, you have a word like phenomenon, or cri uh, another word like criterion with an O-N ending, and those become phenomena or criteria, and so, so you notice that with the, uh, with phenomenon, um, uh, you add the A with criterion, you uh, drop the O-N and add the um, uh, I-N. There are some words in which you change the interior uh, vowels, um, and these are not predictable, um, uh, uh, but uh, they're a word like man, which becomes men. Of course, women uh, is a plural form of woman. Um, foot becomes feet. Tooth becomes teeth. Okay, so uh, and again, these are not predictable. And and if you go back to our discussion about verbs, um, uh, and our discussion about irregularity, you know, it's not predictable. Um, and so these you just have to learn as a one-off. And and uh, in the text, you know, uh, these issues are addressed, and you'll see um, uh, lists about common words that uh, fall into this irregular pattern. And there's one other form. Um, for the plural, in, in, uh, which is irregular, and that is the word doesn't change at all. So uh, that's a word like deer. Okay, uh, There's one deer on the hill. No, there's three deer on the hill. You see, I didn't say deers. I said deer. Um, uh, uh, one fish, two fish. You see, so you know the fish... Re remain singular. Now, the exception to that is if you're talking about different species of fish, you know, there are many fishes in the sea, but that means species of fish. Um, on the other hand, you could say there are many fish in the sea. That just means, you know, the all the different kinds of fish lumped together, and there are many fish. And another such word is sheep. 
So, you know, uh, uh, he doesn't have a herd. He just has one sheep. Or he has a herd of sheep. You know, he has a hundred sheep in his herd, you see. So we don't change it. The word remains unchanging. So these are the irregular nouns. And uh, we're going to go forward and we're going to learn another aspect about nouns in the next slide. This is an issue that um, comes up quite a bit in, in writing uh, these days. And that is creating a plural with an apostrophe S. This is absolutely incorrect. Um, whenever you see it, uh, whenever you see somebody trying to create a plural with an apostrophe S, you know, laugh softly behind your hand. <laughs> like that, okay? Um, uh, because it's absolutely wrong. Uh, the plural is not formed with an apostrophe S, but as we've discussed, just with the S, or in some cases, the ES, or the IES, or some other forms. Uh, so, it, so as we see uh, over here, uh, it is two cats. Uh, without an apostrophe, not two cat apostrophe s. Okay, seven rooms uh, with just an s, not seven rooms with an apostrophe s. Okay, so the is does uh, uh, the apostrophe s does something else entirely. It uh, it indicates what's called the possessive, but not the plural. So you have to remember this. And uh, in a moment we'll uh, we'll go forward and we'll discuss just what the apostrophe s does. There's something in English called the possessive, which indicates some sort of ownership. Okay, one possesses it. Um, and this is formed, for the most part, with an apostrophe S. So uh, we see some examples over here. The cat's bowl, Bob's car. It's, all these are apostrophe S. Mary's house, the man's attitude. You see, so the apostrophe S uh, distinguishes uh, this form from the plural. So it's not two cats okay, who are somehow attached to a bowl. Um, it is the bowl that belongs to the cat. So the apostrophe S indicates something belongs to something else. Okay, So it's very simple. Uh, and we'll go forward and we'll take a look at, uh, at how you create a possessive with a plural. What do you do if the word already ends with an S? So you have a plural. Okay, so we'll take a look at that. But for the singular, uh, it's very simple. You simply add an apostrophe S. The plural possessive uh, does something a little bit different. It does not add an apostrophe S. For the most part, it adds just an apostrophe after the S. Because remember, the word is already pluralized. Okay, so you have the girls' volleyball team. So note over here, okay, the girls' volleyball team. That's the volleyball team that belongs to all the girls. So we have girls pluralized, and then we add the apostrophe to indicate the possessive. The father's plans. These are all the fathers. They've gotten together. They're planning a uh, wonderful weekend trip for the kids. And so the father's plans. Okay, so it's the plural father, which becomes fathers, and followed by the apostrophe. Uh, and the same with the Joneses' home. That's the home that belongs to all the Joneses. Okay, so now uh, one of the um, uh, things to watch out for is if you have a plural word that does not end with an S, that is, it's an irregular plural, then you do add the apostrophe S. So you have this is the men's locker room. You see, men's apostrophe S. So men is already plural. And and you add the apostrophe S to indicate the possessive. And one last thing uh, to compare, and hopefully to make this clear for you, compare uh, the two forms of the team's uniforms that we have over here. Okay, so one is the team's apostrophe S uniforms. Uh, what are we talking about there? How many teams are there? Well, there's one team. It's a singular team with an apostrophe S. That means it's the it's the possessive. It's the singular possessive. But if, however, you have the team's uniform pronounced exactly the same, uh, uh, don't don't be confused. I mean, you know, you can't really tell from listening uh, what uh, what the difference is. But with an S apostrophe, that indicates plural teams. That indicates more than one team. So, you know, the team's uniforms are held in the stadium until the game day.
some something like that. Okay, so the team's uniforms, more than one team has uniforms. Okay, so uh, apostrophe S for the singular, but S apostrophe for the plural, unless, of course, you know, you have one of those irregular um, nouns such as men or oxen, words like these, um, in which case uh, you would use the apostrophe S. Okay, hope that's clear. Um, again, you can consult the text. Um, take the um, uh, check your knowledge um, uh, exercise. And of course, feel free to uh, post any kind of questions that you might have in the chat area. We've touched on this before. Nouns that look like plurals, but are treated as if they're singular. And in a sense, they are singular. So economics, gymnastics, Olympics. The Olympics is my favorite sports activity. Okay. Um, uh, ethics is a difficult subject. Okay. Social studies is easy. You know, things like this. I mean, you know, so these are singular. And also have to uh, keep in mind that sometimes if you're dealing with an amount, you think of it as a singular amount. So two lumps of sugar is all you need. A thousand miles is not too far to go for a true love. Um, a hundred dollars is too high a price. You see, all these are singular if you're dealing with uh, them as a single unit. Um, uh, an example might be in, in, in terms of the price. Um, the price is a hundred dollars or a hundred dollars is the price. So, so that's singular. But if I said uh, there are a hundred dollars in one dollar bills scattered all over the floor. You see, so there are a hundred dollar bills. Okay, so um, so if I'm dealing with it as a quantity, then something like a hundred dollars um, uh, is plural. But if I'm dealing with it as a singular amount, a a price or a weight or a measure, then that's um, uh, singular. Okay. So anyway, uh, now we're going to go on to another little tricky aspect of nouns. Uh, nouns that are treated as if they're plural, but they really comprise a singular item. And we'll take a look at those. Another form of the noun that might cause us an issue are nouns that look like and are treated as if they're plural, but really they're a singular item. So um, an example, uh, might be scissors. You see, there's only one pair of scissors, or you see already I call it a pair, right? But there's only one item there, one item that cuts, and we call it the scissors. But the scissors are on the table. So you see, even though there's one item, I still refer to it in the plural. Um, uh, I reuse the plural verb, are. And same with pants and panties. Don't get your panties in a wad, as the saying goes. Your panties are in a wad. You see, so that's the plural. Same with spectacles and glasses, as in you know the you know, the these things, these things that you wear like that, right? Uh, uh, there's a singular item, but it's um, referred to in the plural, and you use the plural verb. Uh, riches, you know, his riches uh, are great. Okay, um, uh, but it, that's a singular wealth, and if we use the word wealth, uh, his wealth is great, then it would be singular, but the word riches would be uh, plural. Same with jitters, you know, uh, you know, my jitters are getting the better of me. You see, again, we use the plural, but it's only one thing, one feeling. You see, I could say my fear or my anxiety is getting the better of me. That would be singular, So, but jitters, for some reason or another, only exists in the plural form, even though you might think of it as a, as one thing, one one emotion that uh, that overwhelms you. And there's no such thing as a jitter. You can't say my jitter got the best of me. Um, and remains, as in the um, uh, the uh, the remains of our dear departed are in an urn on the mantelpiece. Okay, so the remains are. Okay, so again, it's not, you know, our dear departed did not have more than one body. He, you know, he or she only had one body, but we refer to it as the remains, not the remain. Okay, so anyway, so these are nouns that are treated as plural, even though the items they represent are really singular. We've touched on before the uncountable nouns. Uh, these are nouns that cannot be quantified for the most part. Like, though there might be some some exceptions, so such word is love. Uh, 
You cannot say, I have 10 loves for you. Okay. I, I have so much love for you. Okay. Um, and if somebody says, I have so much to love for you, you can't say, well, how many? How many loves do you have for me? You see, that doesn't work because love in this sense is always in the singular. You can't say there are 20 pollutions today. No, there's a lot of pollution today. Maybe there are 20 chemicals in the water that the oil company dumped into the lake, but uh, there's only pollution. There is pollution in the lake, okay? Uh, you can't say, uh, move the furnitures into the kitchen uh, or into the living room or into any room. You can't say the furnitures. Furniture is always singular, okay? Move the furniture into the other room or move the pieces of furniture into the other room. You see, so you can say pieces of furniture. Pieces can be pluralized, but not furniture itself. Uh, you cannot say, pass me the salts, please. You know, you're, you're sitting down to dinner. Uh, you're going out and you want to impress somebody, you know, a special someone. You want to impress them. And you say, pass me the salts, please. Well, that wouldn't quite impress them, right? Because uh, uh, they would be thinking, well, salt is one of those uncountable nouns. So here's somebody who doesn't know the countable from the uncountable nouns. Hmm, not a very attractive choice for me. I'm going to look elsewhere, you see. So grammar is important. Okay. Anyway, um, and likewise, I need some waters to drink. No, you'd say I need some water to drink. Though, as in um, the example that I gave you before, sometimes we use a word like water uh, to indicate a glass of water. So if a waiter comes up to the table and say, can I get you some waters? Well, he wouldn't say, can I get you some waters? He'd say, can I get you some water? And you would say, yes, I would like three waters, please, because there's three of you s sitting at the table. So you see, you're, you're using the word a little bit differently. And when you say, I would like three waters, you really mean I would like three glasses of water. Um, but for the most part, a word like water cannot be pluralized. It is uncountable. Okay. Another, uh, I don't know if you'd call it peculiarity, uh, but special trait of nouns is that nouns can take an article. And that's either an indefinite article or a definite article. And let me explain. It was not that complicated. Um, an indefinite article is a word like a. Uh. It's the a uh that comes before the noun. So a house, a pony, a plane, a city. So now you notice how it's indefinite. It's indefinite because I'm not pointing at any particular house, pony, plane, or city, right? I'm just saying a city, you know, or I'm saying a house. I'm not talking about your house. I'm just talking about a house in general. Uh, on the other hand, the definite article um, points at a particular house or pony or plane or city, a particular object. So it's the the. Now, you notice we aren't going so far uh, in the identification of this item, this noun, this person, place, or thing, uh, to name it. Uh, but I am being more specific, okay, more definite. So that's what we call the definite and the indefinite article. Um, and we're going to go forward and we're going to talk about one little aspect of the indefinite article uh, that's important in English uh, grammar. Now, there is a variation in the rule for the indefinite article. It's not always a. Uh, sometimes it's an. So if you look at the list over here, um, you'll see a list of words, some of the words that take an as an article rather than a. Uh, and that's an aviator, an eagle, an oven, an umbrella, also an hour and an honor. Now, one of the things that you might notice here, the pattern that develops, is if a word begins with a vowel, or more importantly, a vowel sound. Um, probably, you know, we, we do this, or this uh, pattern developed in English, because it's easier to say an eagle rather than a eagle, you see. So there'd be a break there, and, it's, and, and the mouth just finds it easier to wrap around uh, some sort of intervening consonant rather than um, two vowels right, right in a row. Um, uh, but you'll notice an anomaly as well. Here we have uh, an example of a couple words, our and honor, that begin with a consonant, but take the N as well. So the pattern here is it's the vowel sound because we don't say a hour, we say an hour. You see, so that's a vowel sound at the beginning of the word. So, uh, so if the word begins with a vowel, 
or a vowel sound, then it would take an and um, uh, instead of an a uh, as an indefinite article. Now, in the next slide, I'm going to talk about um, some vowel beginning words that don't take the and. And I don't know if you'll be surprised, but <laughs> uh, or even if you'll consider it fun. But um, uh, but we'll touch on it briefly, and then we'll go forward from there. Here you see a list of nouns that all begin with vowels, and um, but we use the indefinite article a uh, with it, which seems to contradict the rule that I've just established. If it begins with a vowel, use an. But the reason that we use a uh, rather than an um, as the indefinite article uh, for these words is because they are pronounced as if they had a consonant in front of them. So, for instance, we say a unicorn, uh, uh, and further over here you'll see um, uh, I've tried to indicate how we pronounce it. So we pronounce a unicorn as if it's a Y-O-U, a unicorn, you see. So it's not a Uni, it's not an unicorn. It's a unicorn. You see, it's it's even difficult to say that. Um, we say a U.S. soldier because it's a U.S. soldier. Okay. We say a eulogy for the same reason uh, because it seems to have uh, it seems to be pronounced with a Y sound, a consonant sound at the beginning of the word. And for the same reason, we say a union or a use. Okay. So. Um, and we can see how this shifts back and forth with um, H words, words that begin with the letter H, because we would say an hour, an hour, okay, because we do not um, uh, pronounce the H in that word. You know, we say it as hour. We don't say hour, okay. We don't say uh, hour. However, you can see and compare this with a word like history, that we do pronounce the H. We say history. So it's a history. Okay, so anyway, uh, so I hope this makes it more clear um, how we use the an in place of the a uh, as an indefinite article with some words and some words we don't. So to wrap this up, I'm going to summarize the parts that nouns play, that is, the parts of of the sentence that nouns play and nouns uh, figure into the sentence in many different areas so let's just take a look at this first nouns can be the subject of a sentence so caitlin graduated with honors you see caitlin is the subject of the verb uh in this going back to what we're talking about uh in uh, in another lecture or several lectures before uh the word caitlin is the actor who is doing the doing uh, that's represented by the verb graduated. Um, a noun can also be the direct object of a verb. So the president awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor to the hero. The president awarded the medal to the hero. So what did the president award? The object of the verb is the medal, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, nouns can be the direct object of verb. The husband, feeling guilty, bought his wife flowers. So bought flowers for his wife, you see. So that's the indirect object. Uh, he bought flowers. Flowers would be the direct object. But re remember the rule for figuring out the indirect object. If you can change the, um, uh, the, the noun uh, to an object of a preposition, to to sent flowers to his wife or bought flowers for his wife, then that's the indirect object. And lastly, nouns can be the object of the preposition. So the plane flew over the city. Remember the preposition? Um, and very briefly, we touched on it in parts of speech, and we have a lesson in prepositions coming up briefly. Uh, uh, but the preposition is one of those words that tells us where we are in relationship to the box. So the noun, as a matter of fact, is very often the object of the preposition. So uh, over the city, we went to the city, we went through the city, uh, we were in the city, you see. So that noun is the object of the preposition. So these are the various roles that nouns play, and they're very important parts of speech, as, as are all the parts of speech. So I hope this lesson has made this clear for you. And uh, again, 
uh, test your knowledge uh, in the uh, check your knowledge exercise. Uh, read the accompanying text and be sure to post whatever questions that you might have in the chat area. And I'll see you next time.